This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, Charles Parizot-Silon is an associate professor in ancient history uh, at the University of Orléans and a member of Iramat, Centre Nest Babylon, uh, a research lab specializing in archaeometrical studies. Uh, he also spent a year last year as the Lucien Dumerc Fellow at the Madrid Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, his research focuses on a variety of topics related to the production, distribution, and uses of coinage in Republican Rome and the Western Mediterranean during the third and first century BC, with an emphasis on archeological material from Southern France and the Iberian Peninsula. Aside from his long-term research interests related to the study of Roman state finance and administration, as well as colonization and military logistics, um, Professor Palizot Silon has more recently been working on developing a global approach of the, to the counterfeiting of Roman coins and other forms of irregular monetary activities in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, he has extensively published on a range of topics, to quote a few, ranging from counterfeiting and non-official issues in Roman Gaul and Spain, to the connection between military donatives and Roman Republican issues, to the patterns of die access in Roman Republican coinage, and uh, the coinage of Antony and Cleopatra. So please join me in welcome uh, Professor Paris Ocillon to this long table, so thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you for this very, very kind introduction. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it was just perfect. I, I, I wouldn't have done it uh, as good as you did. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I've just shared my screen uh, starting now. Uh, let's see if you can see it. It should take some minutes. Perfect. OK, good. Yes. So, um, well, I would like to begin by thanking, of course, the whole ANS staff for inviting me to give this presentation. That's great pleasure for me. And um, in the first, and although I know that he can't attend the, this long table, I would also like to thank Nathan because he contacted me in the first place and he granted me with complete freedom as to the subject of this talk. So I just had to choose and that's, that's a luxury. So, as Lucia said, I am primarily a specialist of Roman Republican coinage and an archaeometrist, uh, being a member of the Iramat team in Orléans. So, uh, what I'll be doing today is presenting some of uh, the analytical data, uh, sorry, uh, which um, I've been acquiring in Orléans over the past 10 years, mostly working on coins from uh, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. Um, the method which we use in, in, in uh, Orléans is uh, LA-ICPMS. I won't go into the technical details today, but of course, if you have questions about it during the discussion, I'll be just happy to, to answer to them. Um, so, um, my initial idea for this presentation uh, was to expand on some research that I have been um, um, Participate, participating in for some time in relation with the development of uh, um, Roman presence in Southern Gaul and uh, the circulation of Roman coinage uh, in the years that followed the supposed so-called conquest of the 120s BC. Um, over the, the past few years, uh, several colleagues, most of them being mostly specialists of Celtic coinages, have dealt with this topic and what they did was emphasizing um, the scarcity, the rareness of Roman Republican material in coin finds in Gaul, in Mediterranean Gaul, uh, during the late Iron Age. And that was, uh, I think, something important. An important paper in this regard is that which is on the left here, which was published by these three folks, Julia Genekesi, Elodie Paris, and Eneko Iriart. Um, a paper which dealt with uh, the, what changed and most importantly what didn't change uh, in local monetary affairs in Southern Gaul uh, after the conquest in 120. So the, their point was that basically the Roman conquest couldn't, almost couldn't be seen um, in the numismatic records. And so 
I also published something with, along with Nico, that's the chapter on the right here, on the same topic, but on the on a slightly longer period from 120 to 70, more or less. Um, so I wanted to expand on these questions. And the thing is that upon working on these questions, I came to regret that I was not able to fully explore a specific case study, which to me was crucial in understanding what was going on in, in Southern Gaul at that time. And so I thought that today's long table would be a perfect match for this, you know, just having some time to go into the details of one coin series. And so this is what I'll be doing today, uh, focusing on uh, the uh, RRC 282 uh, denarii, which are these ones on the right, um, the so-called Narbonne series. So um, the, the idea is to build on that, uh, that, case, that case study in order to address more general questions about the development of Roman and Italian presence uh, and the circulation of Roman coinage in Southern Gaul, uh, the founding of Norbo Martius, Narbonne, and the construction of the Via Domitia, a Roman road which at first connected the Pyrenees to the Rhone and later on also to the Alps, and which uh, the construction of which began around 120. So basically, I'll be asking two questions, which were there, I think, yes. Uh, well, that's, that's simple, right? How did the Roman state pay for these building programs? And what were the expected benefits, especially in terms of Roman public finance? Um, however, for those of you who might not be entirely familiar with the geography of southwestern France, and I can understand that, I thought that would be useful to begin with a map. So here's one taken from Corinne Sanchez's book on Narbonne. Uh, so that's the region which we'll be mostly talking about today. Um, there is, uh, here is the Mediterranean. In fact, that's the Gulf of Lyon. Uh, Narbonne is here. That's really southwestern France. Spain uh, had the Pyrenees here, so Spain is southwards. Um, so you can see uh, here in dark gray. Uh, can you see the, the, the cursor, the mouse? Yeah, nice. Uh, so here is the Massif Central. And uh, more uh, particularly, what interests us is the Montagne Noire here, as well as the Mont d'Or here, uh, of course, the Pyrenees. And um, as you can see, here is a lagoon area. That's where um, Narbonne was built, the Bear Lagoon area. And that's connected to the Aude River, river sorry, uh, and then to the Garonne River, which goes all the way down to Toulouse, uh, here, and then to the Atlantic, Agen, Bordeaux, and then the Atlantic. So that's basically the region which we'll be working on today. Um, this presentation will be very basically split into four parts, uh, with the first one being mostly about the historical and numismatic context. Um, parts two and three will be uh, about RC 282 properly, uh, with part three focusing on analytical data. So I'll try to make it as clear as possible. And uh, part four will be an attempt at getting um, to broader conclusions uh, about the impact of getting affairs on Rome's economy and public finance. And so without further ado, let's just proceed with part one, Roman coinage and trade in southern gold uh, from 120 to 80 BC. Um, the first thing which I uh, would like to uh, uh, to say is that um, the conquest itself is very difficult to see in the numismatic records. The military operations that were carried out by the Roman armies in, in Provence, so in southeastern France, during the 120s, did not seem to lead to a massive inflow of Roman Republican currency uh, to the west of the Alps. Um, of course, there's the evidence from the battlegrounds, the towns which, which were besieged by the Romans in Provence, but the evidence is scarce. Uh, in Entremont, a town which was besieged and destroyed in uh, 123, we have 12 specimens of silver Roman coins with the, 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 the um, later one dating, being dated from 126, 
but that's that's it. And in fact, we do have we have many many more Messadian coins than Roman coins in Otremont. And the same uh, applies to other towns which were besieged and destroyed by the Romans, such as in Bauru, for instance. So Messadian coinage really paid for the, the conquest, apparently. Um, and for the period which follows this conquest, generally speaking, the circulation of Roman coins was very limited in Mediterranean Gaul before the middle of the first century. These coins tend to cluster on a small number of settlements, especially around Narbonne, uh, as well as in Vieille Toulouse. So Toulouse, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, Vieille Toulouse was by far the, uh, the, the, the largest marketplace in southwestern Gaul at the time. That's this point here, exactly. Uh, and so um, in Vieille Toulouse, uh, a substantial number of Republican asses and fractions uh, were discovered, as well as denarii and quinarii, but most of them date from the early to mid first century BC. Um, so apart from some of these settlements, we find very, very uh, few Roman Republican coins in early contexts in Southern Gaul. Hordes of Roman coins are rare as well. In fact, you can count them on one hand, uh, at least before the, the, the central decades of the first century. And that's, that's completely different from Italy, of course, but also from the Iberian Peninsula in the same period. For the same period of time, 40 years, which uh, I'm, I've been uh, referencing here, I guess the Iberian Peninsula has, uh, I, I think we know something like 150 Roman coin hordes, and we have like three in France, something like that. Uh, so elsewhere in Mediterranean Gaul, we can find uh, the greatest concentrations of Republican currency uh, in settlements, which are located close to Roman roads, either the Via Domitia or uh, the Regalden Way in southwestern France. Uh, so the, these are um, settlements like Ambrosum, Nîmes, uh, L'Ermitage. Uh, but the thing is, most of these coin finds, and in fact, um, a vast majority of the coin, find, coin finds, which you can see on this map here, are much later than 80 BC. They date from after 70, and more, most of them date from after 50, in fact. So that's the first point. Roman coins were rare in southern France, even during the 40 to 50 years following the conquest. However, uh, Italians, as is known, played a more and more significant role in trans-regional trade uh, in Mediterranean Gaul from the second century onwards. Um, they were permanently active in local marketplaces such as Gatara or the Toulouse, again in the same region in Languedoc. Uh, and starting in the middle of the, um, sorry, of the, of the, the second century, Italian wine and ware not only complemented but gradually replaced uh, that from Massaria. Um, so it might be thought that at first uh, the Massadians themselves acted as intermediary in this trade of uh, Italian commodities, but the archaeological evidence now suggests that quite quickly the Italian, uh, well, Italian companies became autonomous and just worked without the Massadians in this region. So the period uh, 120 to 80 especially sees uh, the spread of Italian, Dressel, 1A, Amphoras on the Rhone Valley and southwestern Gaul. And then they were replaced in the first century by Dressel 1B. Um, this, you can still see on this distribution up here the concentrations in southwestern Gaul and the Rhone Valley here. Um, this is also the period which sees um, Italian black lace pottery. Um, being massively exported towards Gaul until local workshops were also opened in Gaul. And that's what you can see on the distribution up um, on the right. So, you know, Italians just were there and they were trading commodities in, in, in this region. Besides, it is famously known from a fragment of Posidonius, which I didn't reproduce here, that already in late second century, Italians would also have engaged in slave trade in southern Gaul in quite a dramatic way. I mean, just trading slaves against wine. But not only did uh, locals have to deal with uh, uh, Italian merchants, 
Roman officials also had to deal with Italian firms, notably for the construction and then the maintaining of the new road network. And the pillar of this road system, of course, was the Via Domitia itself. Um, so the working force used for these programs must also have included locals, but uh, it seems that um, Italian engineering companies were basically the companies which got the public contracts to work with Roman authorities in uh, constructing and then maintaining this network. And this is, uh, for instance, known for the, uh, the 70s BC, thanks to Cicero's Pro Fonteo, where he mentions how the governor Fonteius uh, cooperated with Italian contractors uh, for the maintaining of uh, the road system, which eventually raised concern for corruption, but that's, that's a whole different story. Um, um, and of course, Narbonne itself was an integral part of this global scheme of the development of road network. It was at the same time an entry gate to the market of Vieille Toulouse and the Atlantic. It was a safe port close to Hever, Spain, as well as the operated base um, of Roman officials and Italian companies altogether, and its cadaster um, remodeled in 118, uh, the Narbonne B cadaster, fully integrated the Via Domitia, some remains of which can still be seen in the town today, as you can see on the top here. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's an official picture from, this, from the town uh, it itself. Here is the town hall of Narbonne, and here is a, the remains of the Via Domitia, just on the central place of the city. Uh, finally, Italians also um, invested in uh, mining exploration activities. Uh, that's really important, I guess, especially for me and for what, what is to follow. Um, Italian companies uh, based in Western Languedoc began to um, explore different mining districts, especially in southwestern Massif Central, as well as uh, in the, in the eastern, the French Eastern Pyrenees for, for um, um, well, as well. Uh, so they were present, uh, for instance, uh, here in the Montagne Noire, here in the Mont uh, These are places with um, um, mines which produce silver, uh, much silver, in fact, and these uh, silver mines were also exploited before and at the same time by uh, the local Celtic tribe, which was the Rutini, which we'll be, uh, we'll be mentioning um, later. And the Rutini actually used the silver to strike their own coins, so that will be useful for us. Um, so um, the locals, as well as the Italians, were exploiting somehow different mines in the same regions. Uh, the archaeological evidence shows that at least some Italians uh, engaged in uh, mining exploration activities during the second half of the second century at the latest. And here, for instance, are the remains of Italian uh, pottery uh, in a gallery um, in a mine exploited by miners in Fourne Cabardes here, the Barranc Mine in the Montagne Noire. Uh, that's the late second century, probably. And you can also see here, and I think the Miss Mattis will like it, these very nice lead tesserae, which were found in a school in the Mont d'Or. Uh, these are lead tesserae dating from supposedly the late second to early first century. And in this period, which is quite early, right, uh, is mentioned a Societas Argentifodinarum Rutinarum, a company for the civil mines of the Rutini. Uh, a company which was probably based in Narbonne itself. So that's it. You see the Italians just arriving in the region and trying to explore the resources and trade with local populations. So while Roman coins were still very in, un, uncommon in local circulation in the early first century, in many ways, uh, the Italians um, had grown on to become a major component of local communities in the coastal areas of southern Gaul. Just, just on the coast, right, but in the coastal areas, it was clearly the case. And so they were both profiting from the endogenous economic boom that affected the whole region at this period, and at the same time, well, uh, contributing, to, contributing to it to some, um, some degree, right? And so that's the whole context for the, um, the development of the coinage, which we'll be interested in in a minute. And that's uh, that's my part two, RRC 282. Let's get into it and first ask this question. Is this really a colonial coinage? 
Um, so coins, finally. Um, I should begin with a reminder for those of you who might uh, be less familiar with Republican coins, especially. Uh, from the beginning of the second century uh, to the outbreak of the civil wars in the 80s, it is usually believed that virtually all of Roman coinage was only struck in one mint, located in Rome itself. Um, that would change afterwards, but in this period it was the case. And there's one notable exception to this rule, and that is precisely this series, RRC 282. Um, for this reason, as well as, as for other reasons, this series has been the subject of an abundant bibliography since the 1920s. Um, I will not go into the details today, but most widely accepted interpretation, which has been championed by Michael Crawford, among many others, uh, is that these coins were struck in Narbonne itself upon its founding in 118 BC. Um, um, in other words, it is sometimes understood as the inaugural coinage of the very first full name Roman colony outside Italy, which is quite something, I guess. Um, it is entirely composed of denarii, the median weight of which perfectly fits that of denarii struck in Rome with 3.85 grams. Um, the obverse and reverse types are rather conventional at first look. You have a helmeted portrait of Roma on the obverse and a bigger on the reverse, just like your usual traditional denarius. But it does um, sport some unusual features since uh, first, well, the identity of the chariot here on the reverse is quite original. It's uh, uh, look at the weapons and, and his nudity. That's uh, the stereotype of a Gallic warrior. So it commemorates recent victories by the Romans in Southern Gaul, supposedly. Uh, but second, and most importantly, um, another unusual feature is the use of serrated flanks. Now, serration had not been used by the Romans in more than 30 years by then, and it was the very first time that it was used on a large scale. So given the rarity of earlier serrated types, they're almost non-existent in circulation, this feature enough would have set these coins apart in circulation when compared with both denarii struck in Rome and Iberian denarii, which were more common in the south. So that's a very, very unusual feature. Um, apart from that, the series is essentially divided into five subseries with the same types, uh, each of them uh, coming with a, specific, with a specific combination of names of uh, monias. All coins uh, feature on reverse the abbreviated names of Lucius Licinius and Cnaeus Demetius, um, Lucius Licinius Crassus and Cnaeus Demetius Anabarbus. Uh, but um, each subseries was also sub sub supervised by one specific individual, the name uh, being on the obvious in most cases. So we have 282 1 by Marcus Aurelius Chorus, 2 by Lucius Cosconius three by Caius Meliolus, uh, four by Lucius Pomponius, and five by Lucius Porcius Licinus. Um, these five men have been labeled, labeled as junior magistrates in the bibliography, although, well, the very fact that they were elected magistrates either in Rome or in Orbo is entirely hypothetical. Um, as far as I know, and I think it's important, uh, no dialings are known between different subseries. Um, it is also quite an extensive series, with even when compared with the standards of that time. Uh, Richard Schaefer, to whom I'm most grateful uh, for the information he had provided me with some years ago, came to a total count of 236 uh, obvious dice for all five uh, subseries with an estimated total ranging between, well, 300 and 360 uh, obvious dies following either, you know, Carter or Estes formula. So maybe more like 360, something like that. Uh, I'll, go, I'll get back to this table later, but let's just use this right now. So if we postulate that this was the inaugural coinage of Noble Martius, uh, in other words, that the, these coins would have been meant to be distributed to the initial settlers of the colony, then it would mean that each of those 2,000 settlers would have received a nest egg of between 
well, 2,000 and 4,500 denarii, which was worth several decades of pay in the army. So, frankly, I do not think that this is why these coins were made for. Uh, we must find another explanation. And that's the big thing right now. Let's look at circulation. As you can see here, the distribution map of courts, including RRC 282 denarii, uh, with closing dates uh, ranging between 118 and uh, 80 BC, according to Crawford's datings, is puzzling in some way. Um, as you can see, this series does not feature in any Roman hall buried either in Languedoc or in France in general for the 40 years which followed the minting of these coins. Um, in fact, the two earliest French hordes featuring RRC 282 both date from 74 BC. That's a whole different context. The war against Autorbius, so Pompey was going through Gaul uh, to uh, wage war against Autorbius. And we have two hordes from about this date, this uh, year, 74. Uh, and among these two hordes, one is from Periac Domela on territory of Narbonne itself. It included one RRC 282-4 coin out of 119 coins. Uh, and as for the second one, the Noyer hold, which is in southeastern France, something like that here, uh, it had five denarii of this series out of 313 documented coins uh, in this hold. So that's just not, not that much, right? Um, besides, stray finds are rare as well. To my knowledge, only two specimens of this series have been documented in southern France in Republican contexts. Uh, one was discovered during field surveys some 20 years ago in Barzon, in Charente Maritime, that's about here. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, and the other also from Périac de Mer, so just south of um, Narbonne, uh, was identified by archaeologists as a counterfeit lead coin, sorry, forgery, presumably. And that's all we've got. Um, no specimen of this series has been discovered in Vieille Toulouse to this day, even though, as I mentioned, this settlement was, uh, has yielded by far the most Roman Republican coins in France for this period. So that's very, very little evidence. And conversely, we find substantial numbers of coin series from um, uh, in uh, from this series, sorry, uh, in hordes from Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, um, southern Spain, Spain, and to a lesser extent in Catalonia, which in fact is a very very common distribution for Roman hordes of this period. So it means that these denarii were quickly and entirely integrated into the stock of Roman civil coinage, which was circulating between um, uh, Etruria, southern Italy, the Mediterranean islands, and Spain, which is basically the network of um, the, the trade network uh, of the time. The only thing which is interesting is that you don't find these coins in hordes originating in Rome or its vicinity in Latio, basically, which would at least be consistent with the idea that they were not struck there, but I don't know. So overall, that's interesting. These are coins which are supposed to have been struck in Southern Gaul and which apparently didn't circulate or at least weren't hoarded or found in Southern Gaul. Um, these were not the coins which the locals in Narbonne would use on a, on a daily basis anyway. What, the, what people in Narbonne and its surroundings used on a daily basis were these coins here, mostly. These are Neron bronze units, so local Iberian-style uh, bronze coins uh, which dominated the monetary facies of most settlements in the very uh, most southwestern tip of France uh, for this period. So that's, you know, you don't find these coins in the region. Let's just compare it with what I would call a proper colonial coinage uh, from the same period. Here is the bronze coinage of Valencia, modern day Valencia in Spain which has been struck uh, um, over several years at some point between the 130s and 70s BC. These are bronze asses and fractions, uh, bearing burrowing types from um, earlier Italian colonies, uh, as to begin with uh, Vibo Valentia. The legends always mention the name of the settlement, Valentia, here on the reverse, on the reverse, and on the obverse, the names of the quaestors 
from the city, uh, which would mean the coins with the queue identifying them. Um, more crucially, maybe, uh, the spatial distribution of coin finds uh, for those bronze coins is centered on Valencia, as you can see here. So the coins actually circulated locally, and you don't find them uh, outside Spain. Also, the volume of issues is more consistent with the scale of local demand, with a total number of harvest dice not exceeding some 120 to 130, split over three series, according to Ripollès. So, I mean, you know, globally, it couldn't be more different than ERC-282. So, um, the, ER the ERC-282 series may not so much be perceived as a colonial coinage, strictly speaking, in my opinion, but it is an extended, exceptional issue of Roman denarii struck outside Rome under extraordinary circumstances for some specific purpose. And well, it's it's fully compatible with the with the, the standard denarius system, but at the same time, these coins are apart thanks to the use of serrated funds. Now, what can be this purpose? That's what I'm trying to understand uh, in part three. Uh, you know, minting operations and silver supply strategies. So back to um, this table. Um, I can only stress out the singularity of the institutional framework in which these coins were made. I don't, and we don't, understand it fully, in fact. It seems surprising to me that no less than seven individuals shared responsibility for the minting of what is usually considered as a unique, straightforward series struck during one single year. That's very odd. It doesn't happen this way, usually. What's more, none of these uh, individuals bear any sort of official title on coins, and you don't have like ex Senatus Consulto in the legend, something like that. So you don't understand how these coins were struck. But an interesting result of Richard Schaeffer's die counts, which may be useful uh, to you know, better understand this organization, is that as you can see, um, there's a very clear homogeneity in the number of dies used for the minting of each of the five subseries. Um, subgroups 282 slash one, two, four, and five were all struck using about 70 um, to 80 of the dice according to Estes formula, uh, with only subgroup number three being slightly um, smaller in the light of extent evidence. Um, that, that's the only one. To me, this seems to reflect some degree of production planning, if these groups were struck consecutively, or of uh, coordination if they were minted at the same time, but in different places. Uh, my guess would be that at least four of those five individuals who were entrusted with minting these coins were originally provided with the same number of dies and similar instructions, and uh, they just had to strike a predetermined volume of coinage, the same uh, in each case, something like that. Um, now, with the archaeometrical data. Um, analytical results help to refine this picture. So the sample for the series here is composed of 41 coins from Paris. Uh, all of them were analyzed by myself in Orléans again, and uh, I shall say that some comparisons have already been made with the provisional results of the Rackham project from Warwick, uh, and they are fully consistent with, with my results. So first the thing is, um, all subgroups of this series were struck with pure refined silver with an average bullion content of 99.9%. So that, that's pure silver, really. It's not exceptional per se, because denarii struck in Rome during the same, the same period, the late 2nd century, were not debased either by the addition of copper. Uh, but what is remarkable instead is the... Um, the purity of the silver bullion itself, which comes with unprecedentedly low levels of impurities on average when compared to coins, to coins struck earlier in Rome. So let's just look at it. Here we've got uh, a graph showing two of the main trace elements for silver coins, uh, gold and bismuth. Gold is on the x-axis, bismuth is on the y-axis, and both have been ratioed over silver. Um, so these are the, the most trustful trace elements for the identification of silver stocks and supply strategies, and that's 
why I'm looking at them. Um, here you can see in yellow uh, subgroups RSC 282 1 and 5. And what you can see is that they have, they display very low goal concentrations uh, on average 70 ppm. And that's a feature which has rarely been seen in coins struck in Rome during this period or earlier than that, but uh, which is common for local Celtic coins of the routine. These are the coins which I mentioned earlier. These are these ones here, and these are your light yellow points here. So as you can see, the silver used for the for the minting of local Celtic coins and of this part of the RC two eighty two series is identical. So it would suggest that the metal directly comes from Mont d'Or or Montagne Noire southwestern Massif Central. Conversely, subgroups RC two and three in blue tend to display higher, more heterogeneous gold concentrations, as well as slightly more stable bismuth contents. Um, that's not that much, in fact, when you compare it with other countries, but still it's, it's more, and there's more gold in them than in the first group. And that's particularly reminiscent of coins struck in Messalia in the same period. That's your yellow, uh, your light blue points here although it also matches the, the signature of other Western countries of the period. So that's just one hypothesis among others. As for RRC 282-4, uh, in green here, it somehow kind of seemed to fill the gap between the two trends. So that might suggest the use of a mixed stock, something like that. So based solely on archaeometrical reasoning, these trends could be identified, uh, interpreted, interpreted sorry, in two different ways. One possible possibility is if there is only one mint, Narbonne, for instance, then it had access to two consecutive stocks of silver bullion with distinct chemical properties and geological provenances. So it would mean that uh, all subgroups were used in a row, were struck in a row with two different stocks being used and num uh, group number four being transitional between these two groups, something like that. Another possibility is that this coinage was produced in at least two different mints, each being provided with specific stocks of silver with different provenances. And in this case, subgroup number four might have been produced somehow, maybe later, with whatever metal was uh, still available in those mints, something like that. So these are the two, the two possibilities. Um, in other words, the analytical data tends to strengthen the hypothesis of a Languedocian origin for at least part of the silver bullion used for the minting of the RSC 282 coinage. That's now almost sure. Um, um, I wish data from late isotopic analysis could confirm this uh, in the future, but for now we have to do without it. Um, this bullion could come from, well, you know, the smelting of silver um, taken from the routine uh, or their neighbors or from, from mines directly, we cannot be sure about it. Now, based on all sorts of available evidence, I would be inclined to think that the most plausible interpretation for the purpose of this series is that it was directly related with the construction of the Via de Mitia, starting around 120. And considering the size of this issue, which is important, I'm, it might have lasted for more than a year, which is possible uh, if um, it was struck under the authority of pro-magistrates. That's, that's possible, including maybe Knaeus Demetrius Aenobarbus, the pro-consul himself. That would explain several different points, which I already referenced. First, the nature and the size of this issue, which does not seem to match the local needs of Roman settlers in Narbonne. Also, the specific institutional framework of its minting, which seems to reflect a certain degree of coordination between various Roman officials. Also, the use of serrated flans, which um, would be consistent with the idea of a specific purpose coinage struck out at Rome. And also, and more importantly, this interpretation, in my opinion, would um, explain the rapid spreading of Italy and Baetica instead of gold itself, of these coins, because the coins, after having been paid to Italian contractors, 
would just follow the financial movements implemented by these Italian companies, and the coins would just move to whichever other territories in Italy or in Spain these companies were active in. So that's that's my interpretation of the data. Um, we should realize the scale of those uh, building programs. Um, never before had uh, had that had that happened on that scale outside Italy before, and so um, the Roman elites, of course, benefited from the development of trade with Italy, but they also had an interest in improving the logistics and the connectivity between both sides of the Pyrenees. And so, what's important here is that it's not just about southwestern France; it's also about Spain. Uh, as it appears, the construction of the Via de Mitia, big on on the northern. Uh, slope of the Pyrenees was strictly contemporary with renewed efforts in improving the road network in Catalonia as well, south of the Pyrenees. Here we have two milestones origin originating from both sides of the Pyrenees, uh, the Via de Mitia and what will later become the Via Augusta. On the left is a milestone bearing the name of Cnei de Mitius Barbas, the proconsul, the one who actually conquered southern Gaul. Uh, it was found some 25 kilometers south of Narbonne. It, it cannot be dated to the years of his proconsulship, so at some point between 121 and 118, something like that. On the right side is another milestone originating from Tona near Barcelona. Uh, it bears the name of Manius Sergius, who is believed to be the governor of Hither Spain uh, during the same period, and it has also been dated to the 110s. Uh, it was also connected to a road directly and on the same road, on the same settlement, in fact, um, well, um, um, uh, an archeological uh, settlement has been excavated in recent years. That's the uh, El Camp de les Fioses. And it goes on to show that the road was actually uh, built or uh, renovated during the same period. So to summarize, I would, suggests that the main purpose of the ERC-282 coinage was to pay for the public contracts concluded between Rome and Italian entrepreneurs for the construction of the road network. Uh, and since um, silver was widely available in Gaul itself, well, it meant that it was simpler and cheaper to strike these coins on the field rather than to, to strike them in Rome and then to have to transport these coins towards Gaul. The whole operation may have been supervised by Roman pre-magistrates, including uh, Domitius Enobarbus himself, and there may be one or more mints, but in any case, I think Narbonne is still among the best candidates for allocating at least one of these mints, or the only, only mints, uh, given its importance in, in Southern Gaul at the time. Okay, so that's about, you know, how Rome paid for those programs. That's at least that's my hypothesis. But what about the benefits? That was the other question which I asked at the beginning. To put it another way, what was the impact of all of this on Roman economy and public finance? And that's what I'll be looking at in the fourth and last part of this uh, presentation, the bigger picture. Um, so again, with analytical results. Uh, but this time we are looking at uh, coins struck in Rome during the same period, the period going from 130 to 100, more or less. Again, what I'm interested in here is um, silver supply strategies. Um, so I'll be looking at um, um, gold and bismuth again, uh, both being um, ratioed on silver again. So that's still the most useful way to identify silver stocks and the evolution of silver supply strategies in Rome in that case all the time. So the analytical sample here includes about 50 denarii struck between uh, the 120s and the 100s, in addition to the 41 for RC282 denarii mentioned earlier. And so the big thing is that there was a, a major phenomenon, uh, a, a huge shift, which has taken place around 120 in the Roman mint. Uh, Rome's silver supply strategies changed quite dramatically in or around 120. Um, indeed, before so, coins produced during the 130s or during the 120s, uh, like the coins which are shown here in, in yellow, um, were struck with a mix of silver, which was quite heterogeneous, but which was somehow dominated to some degree 
by the um, uh, silver from southeastern Spain, Cartagena region. That's here, one uh, uh, 1500 to 1300 ppms of gold, something like that. Uh, and in the um, from about 120 onwards, this changed. Here are coins from the 110s and 100s, and as you can see. Of, of course, you still have coins in the, using the same mix here, but you have many coins with much lower gold concentrations, which very rarely happened before. So low gold contents. If you want to see this uh, in a different way with a more um, robust analysis, in fact, here's a PCA graph, which uh, takes into account the main, um, the nine main trace elements, which I've studied for these coins. Um, and you have, you know, nickel, arsenic, zinc, platinum, etc. And what you can see here is that, uh, you know, there's a huge difference, a, a shift, a gap between the coins struck during 130 and 20s here, and those struck during the two following decades here. So really, something happened in 100 in, in 120 that can be seen from gold and other elements as well. Um, well, let's just. You know, um, put Melbourne into it or or, or C two eighty two and see how it goes. So um, here yeah, this is the same data. So your coins from the one hundred and twenties here. I've just put the Rutini and Massalia back just for comparison. And let's just add Melbourne uh, or or C two eighty two. It goes in here. So as you can see, you know, it matches with part of um, the the early coins, but not that much really. But it does match uh, for RC282 slash 2 and 3 with parts of the early production. But when you compare it with what followed in Rome, well, it becomes clear. There's clearly a trend here, exactly here. I should have uh, put uh, a circle here. Um, so there's a trend. It, it suggests that, you know, RC282 seems to announce or to accompany this shift in Roman silver supply during 110s. And it's, you know, it's a good thing since it was apparently struck in 120, 118, so it just works. So this could be taken as evidence uh, for the impact of the exportation of Roman, uh, um, of uh, silver bullion from Languedoc towards Rome. Uh, and it would make sense, you know, to think that uh, the coins from the 110s and 100s would have used these new uh, stocks of silver from Western Languedoc. And what's interesting is that the coin series struck in Rome during these years were especially um, important, um, um, substantial. Uh, the volumes of issues were huge during this period. They were unprecedented, in fact. And so, you know, Rome had access to an ever growing volume of, French, of fresh silver bullion with very little impurities, and they massively turned into new coins. And so, it just seems like Languedoc uh, contributed to it. However, I would like also to just not always simplify the whole thing, um, because in the same period, starting around 120 as well, some Italian companies also began to invest in new silver mining districts in a very different region, in Sierra Morena, in southern Spain, in the region of Cordoba. And uh, these mines would go on to become bigger and bigger, the output would going to equal and then surpass that of the mines from the southeastern part of the peninsula, Cartagena. And so, um, you know, these are the mines which are being exploited at the same time. And even though we do lack satisfying comparative archaeometrical evidence for the silver produced from the galena extracted from eastern Sierra Morena, it does seem like uh, this silver also features, uh, features similar characteristics. Um, to the silver from Western Languedoc, and um, to begin with, very low gold concentrations. So as much as I would like to elaborate on this last question, I think it's time to uh, conclude. Um, let's just say that the contemporaneous development of mining activities, not only in Western Languedoc, but also in the Sierra Morena, and that will be for another presentation, globally changed the structure and the patterns of Roman silver income for about a generation, 20 to 30 years. And that allowed for an unprecedentedly high volume of issues of denarii struck in strictly pure silver uh, in Rome until the beginning of the first century. 
As for ORC-282, it may not be a colonial coinage, strictly speaking, but it does have something to do with Roman building programs and colonial activities, colonial activities in Mediterranean Gaul. I'm, I'm sure about it. And it all began in Narbonne. As for its absence in local circulation, well, I think it only goes on to show how quickly this region was integrated into the wider network of trans-regional trade and circulations across the Western Mediterranean and towards Italy. And um, anyhow, a point which I hope to have demonstrated is that um, Roman public and Italian private interests were deeply intertwined in this region and in this period of time. Um, and that hugely impacted um, how Roman dominion over Languedoc developed in this period. Um, I should, I, I think that the incentives for Roman coin production were not all about state politics, um, taxation, war, or diplomacy, and I believe that this uh, should be more frequently taken into account in, uh, in numismatic studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a really fantastic presentation. And uh, of course, I opened the, uh, the field here, the stage to questions. But first, I have one question that it's really, um, I saw, um, I saw the those uh, those tokens. I think or these unofficial issues that you showed for the mining district, uh, the mining district uh, of um, exactly like uh, in the area of Narbonne. Mm -hmm. and clearly, and I see that there is uh, Clive here in uh, the audience. Uh, they have uh, they actually have the Furnacator which is clearly uh, the, the one which is usually identified as part of the italo Badigan assemblage. So according to you, according to what you're saying in some way, these tokens with this uh, basically specific image in some way were following the societates that went on to exploit Sierra, Sierra Morena. So how do you see that? Because this is actually, because. It is true that uh, nowadays those tokens are not identified anymore as univocally, univocally linked to the mining districts, but at the same time, it's pretty striking that you find them in the mine districts in Gaul and then in Sierra Morena, and then interestingly enough in Italy where there is no mining district, but. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I don't know if Clive wishes to, to uh... Uh, to intervene, but just about, um, yes, indeed, that's the, the same family of types, right? Um, the only difference here is that you do have the Silk Arc Road legend, which in this case uh, confirms that there's a, a link with, uh, with silver mines. But indeed, yes, it's, you know, it's just, uh, um, it's very similar to what we can, um, what we have found in, in, in Sierra Morena as well, in, in southern Spain, in fact. That's, you know, that's your whole global um, now, bunch of Italian companies, I guess. Now, can you hear me? Yes, I cannot see you, but I can hear it. Like, hi. Well, for some reason, my um, camera's not working. I didn't see the Funacator in those uh, illustrations. I... Uh, I did look at them and I took a note. It's from uh, Gourdiol, 1983. Yes. But I... I didn't actually see the Funakato. I would want a shovel on his shoulders for that. Did he have a shovel on his shoulders? I didn't see it. I can show it back to you if you, if you want. I don't remember really about the types. Um, you know, these are the same sorts of types, but I don't remember. Let's just have a look at it. The uh, thing is, there are quite many different types, and I don't... Oh, sorry. Um, I just... Um, feature two of them. There are more of them. And that's here. Yes. Yeah, well, no, you don't have it. But then here. not. This other one, the last one, uh, last one here, it's true that doesn't have, could perhaps have a shovel, but looks remarkably similar to the one from the tokens. But I don't want to hijack the, the, well, the huge tokens of the. Um, which are, for example, the, the Italo-Badigan assembly, but I don't want to, I mean, Charlotte. It's, 
It's definitely interesting, Lucia, but um, to my eye, I don't see the parallel. Um, it's interesting to see um, tokens deliberately link to um, mining, but I don't see it as similar to the ones I know in um, the Sierra Le and Moreno. Okay. Thanks. Uh, other questions? No, here, no. Um... Uh, Lucia? Yes. Hello. I raised yeah, my. Sorry, I, I didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see you. Sorry, sorry. I, I you know, that this was not personal slide. I mean, it's not. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I have a comment and a question. Um, first, a comment. It's. Uh, uh, I find extremely impressive. You know the progresses in archaeometry and metallurgic analysis. Um, when I presented my when I defended my dissertation in two thousand and ten. The main sources on where metal came from, you know, was like Domergue. And we had these kind of qualitative, um, oh, well, impression that there was a shift at some point between Southeast Spain and Gaul. It was very difficult to be, to be dated. And when I'm seeing your charts, where you know by decade you, you're able to see a shift with the content of gold or or bismuth and then oh uh, well around that time that's when um uh, central gold mines started to contribute to the civil supply of rome it shows how much we've learned in in the past 10 15 years and you know laboratories like iramat has been extremely uh, critical in these progress so it's it's six well, it's impressive. Um, now my question, which is, um, you noticed at the beginning of, of, of your presentation that very few of these coins were found locally, um, which led you to question the colonial nature of these series. Now, these coins are still, uh, according to what you have been saying, these coins probably were minted for the construction of, of that road. and the construction workers, whoever they were, were locals or work locally. So why, I still have the same question you asked at the very beginning, why none of these guys seems to have spent these coins locally, but they would have brought them with them back to Spain, back to Italy. Um, what does this mean? Yeah, because uh, sorry for just to echo what uh, Gilles was saying, uh, and sorry, just uh, it is the, exactly the same question. Because, for example, for I don't know RRC thirteen one, which is clearly much earlier, but you do have, uh, for example, the coin finds along the Appian Way, for example, just to say exactly what he was saying. Yeah, so um, as um, as regards, well, it's it's a question of terminology, in fact. What I wanted to emphasize was that uh, it was very different from what you would label as colonial coinages, even in earlier periods, you know, the third century or during the 40s, 30s BC or, you know, other periods, in fact. Um, uh, what, what I would call a colonial coinage is something which was actually meant to be used on a daily basis by the locals. And I think that it was not the case here. Now, who were actually the, the workers uh, employed for the construction of the Via Domitia or Narbon itself, uh, I don't know. Uh, and if they were locals, um, I'm not sure that all of them were actually, no, you know, some of them must have been slaves, for instance. The whole thing is, I, I believe, um, there's a question which I, um, I have been exploring for an earlier period as well. I believe that what Rome wanted to do was to pay um, the companies, the, the people responsible for, for, for these programs. And, and then these guys would just go in and do whatever they want to do uh, when it comes to paying their, their, their working force, um, if they are slaves. Um, in this case, I would suggest that either they paid them and, they, and but just the guys weren't locals or they paid them differently or they just employed slaves or all at the same time. And also just add to that, 
that um, local um, vanquished people had to participate in such programs that was compulsory, you know, and they weren't they, were, they weren't paid for it. So it's um, I guess um, let's say that the, the representatives in charge just went away with the coins. That would be my opinion, but you know that's just one hypothesis. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, two questions relating to the serration. Um, one was the method of production. Was this something that was placed using a rotating grinding tool? And was this done before or after the striking? Was this part of planchet preparation? And secondly, as far as the purpose of it, um, if it was intended that these were going to travel. Uh, was this something of a security device that were they in some way um, stolen en route? They would be clearly marked as to where they came from. Thank you. Um, as regards the, um, the techniques, I, I don't really remember. I think people have worked on this topic. I don't know, maybe other people may answer to this. Um, I don't remember how it was made, but I think we we, we actually know. Uh, as for the, the purpose of it, and that I can answer, um, or at least uh, what I think. Um, there is one thing, which is that, um, you know, there's this uh, famous passage in Tacitus, which says that in the imperial period, uh, the Germans would have um, um, preferred to be paid uh, with uh, bigati or serrati. So, you know, that included serrated coins. And th this went on to, uh, in the bibliography, to suggest that these coins were made for uh, traveling and paying for uh, expenses in foreign lands, etc. I do not see why it would be so, especially since, you know, this passage, uh, it's 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 very late when compared with when these coins were struck. Um, I would suggest that in the case of RC 282, that was a very specific decision to just identify these coins and, and make them look different from all others. And what my interpretation was that it was spe specific purpose. You wanted people to be able to know that these coins were different from the others. Now, I wouldn't have the same idea about uh, later serrated coins struck in Rome from the 100, and, I think 108 or 7, something like that onwards. Uh, just It just became a fashion, I think. Um, you know, some people have argued that they had a, fine, um, an, a higher fineness than other coins, that it would prevent coins from, from breaking when you strike them, but that's just, it doesn't work because all coins of the period are struck with pure silver, either serrated or not serrated, and you know, they're, they're all fine. So I don't think that's a, a technical reason. I think in Rome, it was mostly about fashion or I don't see other explanation for you. Thank you. I see that uh, here we are past uh, two. So, and I don't see other questions here. So really, thank you very much for this fantastic talk, really. Oh yeah, Jill, no, no more questions. So, and uh, see you very soon, hopefully. You, thank yes. You, and okay. we're looking really forward to the publication of all of these.